Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Enrique and I'm one of the fans uh, that collaborate here at the Office of Risk Relations. Today, we are really, really fortunate to have with us uh, Dr. Alessio Fasano. Dr. Fasano, on behalf of the autism community, thank you very, very much for all the work you do and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Enrique, for having me. Appreciate that. So Dr. Fasano has a very uh, impressive and very extensive background, as, as all of you know, uh, which I'm going to try to summarize uh, for the audience. Uh, so Dr. Fasano is uh, a world-renowned pediatric gastroenterologist. Uh, he's a researcher, uh, a research scientist, and an entrepreneur. Uh, Dr. Fasano is chief of pediatric gastroenterology and nutrition at Mass General Hospital for Children. Uh, he directs the Center for Celiac Research, uh, specializing in the treatments of patients of all ages with gluten-related disorders, uh, including celiac, celiac disease, wheat allergies, and gluten sensitivities. Uh, he treats patients with acute and chronic uh, diarrheal diseases and treats infants and children who have difficult to treat uh, gastrointestinal problems. Uh, Dr. Fasano also directs the Mucosal Immunology and Biology Research Center, uh, and is Associate Chief for Basic Clinical and Translational Research. Under his leadership, uh, investigators are studying the molecular mechanisms of autoimmune disorders, including uh, celiac disease and other gluten-related disorders. He has been named visiting professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. Uh, and he authored uh, the groundbreaking study in 2003 that established the rate of celiac diseases at one in 33 Americans, to name one of many, uh, many achievements, of course. Um, so today, uh, in today's uh, webinar, Dr. Fasano will discuss the very critical uh, and what I believe will become a landmark, uh, you know, study in the autism community called the GEMA study. GEMA is an acronym for uh, Genome, Environment, Microbiome, and Metabolism uh, in Autism. Uh, and it is a very, very ambitious study, which hopefully will radically change the way we identify, predict, and hopefully one day help prevent the development of autism symptoms and behaviors in children. As of today, uh, there are no proven biomarkers of ASD, uh, which means that its diagnosis still relies entirely on behavioral evaluations. Uh, the GMS study is actually trying to change that. Uh, it, is, it is really, in essence, a, a biomarker finding type of research that also is, is looking to find uh, suitable and uh, customized uh, solutions for these uh, children. And, and we will really uh, aim at identifying the contributing factors to the development of autism uh, and like I said, possible solutions. Uh, so one thing I would like to mention, a couple of things is that, uh, you know, is that before we started, uh, you can support uh, these very, very important research uh, that Dr. Fasano will be discussing with us today uh, by making tax deductible donations through our partners at the, uh, at the Brain Foundation uh, using the link that is showing up on the screen right now and that we'll be sh sharing this on the comment section below. Uh, and also there's, there's a post right under this video on the Autism Research Coalition Facebook page uh, uh, to make these donations. As you can tell, uh, we have a $100,000 goal and we need everyone's uh, general support to fund this study to ensure its continuation and completion, of course. Uh, among the many things uh, that I didn't mention in the introduction is that Dr. Fasano also happens to serve on the Scientific Advisory Board of the Brain Foundation and, and he was the recipient of, of a grant through, through Brain earlier this year and that's all uh, thanks to the very generous uh, contributions of many families that obviously see that tremendous value in his work and, and the work of many researchers that, you know, are trying to find answers for children and that we very proudly support uh, through BRAIN and ARC. Uh, last but not least, I, uh, I would also like to mention that you can register uh, for free to get access uh, to the Synchrony uh, 2021 uh, conference uh, this year, also organized by, the, by our fundraising partners at Brain, uh, where Dr. Fasano will be providing yet another update on the GMA study in a few months from now on December uh, 11 and 12. Uh, you can register online on the link that is showing up on the screen right now, and, um, and we'll be sharing it in the comment section uh, below. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Fasano, uh, please take it away. Thank you again, Enrique, for the kind invitation and uh, to allow me to uh, share, you know, what uh, uh, we have been doing and we are trying to do with, uh, you know, this GEMMA study and also in collaboration with Brain Foundation. Um, if you can uh, share the slides for me, unless I have to do something about it, um, you know, uh, let's see. Uh, oops. Uh, oh, my fault, guys. My fault. My problem. Um, let me uh, give it, here we go. 
All right, so you should see my slides now. Um, as Enrico was saying, this, uh, this gem, uh, there is the acronym for a multi-omic analysis of, of uh, babies at risk for um, autism is by far the most ambitious study that I've never been involved in my professional life. This is a high risk, but I return uh, kind of operation because if indeed we finally, uh, through this study, will get the basics of why some kids genetically predisposed would develop, uh, you know, would, would be uh, developing uh, autism, this would be transformational. It's the kind of science. And, and of course, you know, it takes a village, it takes a lot of money to do this kind of studies. We had a major emphasis from the European community. We have uh, something like 16 partners from all over the world that with different, different background and different expertise are pitching in to help us really to move the field forward and, and help the, the entire community to really stop uh, this uh, you know, problem or at least try to ameliorate it. Um, why I say stop? Because we are, like many other chronic inflammatory diseases, in the midst of a, an epidemic. I mean, you know, who knows and deals with, for, for personal uh, reasons, uh, with, 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 the, with this problem, it knows that in the past 20, 30 years, there's been a, simply an explosion of cases of autism. Partially, they can be related to the increased awareness and therefore capability to diagnose, but mostly because there is a true, true increase of the incidence of, of the problem. We've seen this in many other um, chronic conditions like uh, cancer, autoimmunity, but nothing so steep like this, moving from one in 5,000 to one in 59 in only, you know, a quarter of a century. So if you look at this, you know, you start to wonder why all this happening? What is fueling, you know, the, the, the pathogenesis of, of, of these epidemics and therefore, you know, why we see more and more cases of kids that develop autism? Um, the old proposition, you know, and, and, and the ones have been working on, and for that reason, my humble opinion, the reason why we still don't have a solution of autism, that we work on a paradigm that turns to be incomplete. We thought that only two things are needed to develop any kind of problem in humankind, including autism. You have to be genetically predisposed. So in other words, you need to be born by, with genes that can put you at risk for the condition. And then you have to be exposed to in the environment that will trigger this immune, uh, you know, this genetic predisposition to move from predisposition to clinical outcome. That turns to be the premise that we've been working on and trying to find solution until the recent past. And then we realized that this is really an oversight of the real story. Yes, genetic predisposition and environmental triggers are absolutely necessary but turns to be insufficient to develop problems like autism. There are at least another three players that we can eventually understand better and be possible target of intervention that we have to consider. Uh, the third being the fact that normally uh, the, 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 the access of these enemies, this environmental trigger in our body is prevented by barriers, the skin and the, the airways, uh, but, but the largest and most complex, uh, you know, port of entry seems to be the GI tract. So a loss of gut barrier, what, you know, some people, they refer as a leaky gut, seems to be a crucial element uh, in, in terms of the, uh, you know, pieces of the puzzle that you need to develop autism. Um, and then, you know, of course, th there is growing evidence, and I believe there is no doubts anymore, that there is a, an inflammatory component, a neuroinflammatory component in autism. So all the immune system, of course, is involved. And last, and definitely not least, this ecosystem microorganism would we co-evolve and, and interact on a daily basis that we call now microbiota, seems to be all five elements extremely important for the pathogenesis of, of autism. Now, I present this you know, separate in, in, a, in an artificial way, but actually there's a lot of interaction as you will see of a mutual influence with each other, particularly this triangulation between gut permeability, microbiome and immune system, so much so that if you have a, an intestinal leaks, your microbiome goes in balance, what we call dysbiosis and vice versa. If you have 
an imbalanced microbiome, this can increase gut permeability. Increased gut permeability allows this molecule to come in our body and instigate the immune system to uh, fight and, and generate inflammation and vice versa. An inflamed tone can increase gut permeability. And of course, this biosis can involve, you know, change in the immune system and vice versa. So there's a lot of interaction. But the most important message that I really want to leave you guys with is that ultimately, it is crosstalk between us and the microbiota, what we call technically epigenetics, that is capable to switch these genes from on and off or off and on that will start this march from genetic predisposition to clinical outcome. All this to say, if I'm born with the genes that put me at risk for autism, it's not destiny that I develop it. If I do or do not, depend how I play my genetic cards. And that's what we want to understand with Gemma. Because if we understand the rules of the games and why we continue to lose this game, then we may develop strategies to play better our genetic cards and try to mitigate uh, the risk to develop, uh, you know, autism who uh, is, is a risk, and also to find targets through the identification of biomarkers, as Rick was mentioning, that will allow us to now to personalize intervention and mitigate this ongoing inflammation that characterizes autism. Um, so, you know, what is this march? How do you move from health to disease? This is a cartoon that, you know, you know, it's a little scheme in which, you know, if you go from left to right, explains what happened at the, on the battlefield, at this interface between us and the environment. So this is the single layer cells that cover the intestine that, among other stuff, they produce this barrier. Under physiological normal circumstances, this barrier doesn't allow large molecules to come through. If they do, they come through under tightly controlled trafficking, what we call antigen sampling. And this translates in glucose tolerance, energy, in other words, we stay healthy. The problem arises when we move from one to two, where the spacing between cells, you know, that we, in the past, we thought that was completely sealed, cemented, and now we know they're safeguarded by sort of doors, loosen up. And therefore, these doors that almost at the time are closed, now, open and allow molecules to go from the gut lumen, so from the environment, into our body. Of course, this influx of enemies will instigate the immune system to fight because, you know, that's what the immune system is there for. They try to protect us against these enemies. And when you fight, it is always collateral damage, this inflammation. This inflammation is mediated by pro-inflammatory molecules that we call cytokines, including tnf alpha interferon gamma, that per se, increase gut permeability. And therefore, now you're in this vicious loops, uh, loop. You have antigen trafficking, inflammation. The inflammation generates more, you know, increased permeability. So you move from two to three. This more increased permeability brings more antigens here until you break tolerance and you develop a disease. What kind of disease? It depends on the kind of disease, that yeah, the genetic predisposition that you have. You are predisposed uh, for a, you know, a TH1 immune response. You develop chronic inflammation like cancer and inflammatory bowel disease, TH2 and food allergies, TH17. You develop autoimmunity and so on and so forth. But one of the key elements that we didn't know, we didn't understand is how I move from one to two. In other words, what are the keys that open this space and these doors that start this march from genetic predisposition to clinical outcome. And, and here, by serendipity, we stumbled on, on a molecule that we named zonulin that remains so far the only physiologic modulator of this permeability. And of course, you know, when you produce too much of this molecule, these doors got stuck open and you develop problems. And now, you know, thanks also with the partnership with the Brain Foundation, we are trying to understand if we have a primary problem, in other words, if I'm born with genes that makes me to produce too much zonulin, what are the, my consequences? What is gonna happen to me in terms of you know, clinical outcome? And, and is that possible this is part of the syndicate that will lead me to you know, develop autism if I have the genes for that kind of problem? And you know, this, this corollary study that we are doing in collaboration with the Brain Foundation 
use this animal model that produce a lot of zoning, what we call the zoning transacting mouse uh, or ZTM to, for short. And, you know, if, if what we're going to do with this mouse, I'll tell you in a moment, but, you know, if we look at this mouse and we measure the permeability of the guts of these mice, they indeed, this gut leaks. So there is too much, you know, um, leakiness in their gut. And now, again, testimonial of this mutual influence uh, among those three elements, we look at the microbiota of uh, these animals, you know, compared to the normal animals, the wild type animals, they so segregate completely differently. And if you ask why they are so separate, what are the elements that makes the difference? Well, in the animals that they produce too much zone and therefore they have a leaky gut, they lost protective microorganisms like, you know, acromantia that, it, you know, put a break on inflammation. And they got very enriched of pro-inflammatory, you know, component like ricanella. So it looks like that, again, the microbiome now is prone to favor, you know, inflammation. And if you look at the immune system of these animals, again, I don't want to go in technical details, but suffice to say that compared to the normal animals, they lose components, you know, soldiers that are anti-inflammatory, so cells that can really mitigate inflammation while they are characterized by an enrichment of the cells they are fighting and therefore create inflammation. All this to say, these animals, they are prone to develop, uh, you know, an inflammatory process. Interestingly enough, these animals also, besides to have an impairment of the gut barrier, they have an impairment of the blood-brain barrier, something that we have seen, demonstrated, and published in autistic kids. And um, if you look at the behavior of these animals, and, you know, uh, one is this, you know, the, the, the way that they behave and move in an open field, this is uh, one of these a behavioral, uh, you know, assessment that we do routinely in, in, in animals that we want to study uh, for uh, um, the model of autism. You see that these animals, you know, these ZTM animals, they move much more. They seem to be much more erratic and they spend time everywhere in the box, while the wild type, they tend to spend more of the time at the edge of the box. That speaks for a, an anxiety or hyperactivity characteristic of these animals. And if you treat these animals with antibiotics, so you take the microbiota out there, now you res res rescue the phenotype. So they look much more like, you know, the wild type animals, and therefore they spend more time on the edge compared to the ones that they still have the microbiota there. All this to say that indeed, as we propose in Gemma, very likely there is a, a continuous communication between the gut and the brain through the gut-brain axis that goes out of control in kids with autism, mainly because there is something in their stools, in their microbiota, that is fueling the process that will lead to neuroinflammation that characterizes autism. So with this uh, Brain Foundation support and collaboration with the foundation, what we are trying to do is what we call this humanized study. So in other words, you know, once we eliminate the microbiota of the animal, we will, you know, transfer the stools of kids with autism or, you know, their sibling counterpart that do not have it and see if the ones that will be transferred, will be transplanted with a microbiota of autistic kids will resume again that kind of behavior that resemble the autistic-like behavior compared to the uh, uh, animals that would be transplanted with kids that they are um, not having that problem. Now, if you look at the list of problems related to zoning, the list is extremely long, extremely long. It goes from cancer to infection to autoimmunity, metabolic disorders. Of course, autism, ADHD has been uh, reported to be associated with exaggerated production zoning. The common denominator here is inflammation. So. It's, that's what really makes the common denominator here. The other thing that is interesting, if, if you look at the genes that have been associated with autism, and these are, you know, the, the, the 23 chromosome of human beings, you have some of these chromosomes where there are a lot of genes related to, um, you know, autism, like, you know, chromosome 7, uh, you know, chromosome 2, and so on and so forth. 
But, you know, very interesting, it's chromosome 16, a tiny chromosome. There are a lot of genes there, one of them being the disonolin gene. So it looks like there is a cluster of genes related to autism that, to which, you know, the disonolin genes seem to be associated. And as I told you, it's been shown and, and, and proved in the literature that, you know, again, um, uh, it, compared to healthy individuals, kids with autism, they have increased disonolin level, and therefore they have the intestinal leaks. Um, and, and, and I told you that we did some analysis in post-mortem, um, you know, some kids that, that passed away that were affected by autism, proving that the blood brain barrier also is affected. So what caused this excessive production of, uh, of uh, zone in the autistic kids? So far, we have seen only two stimuli that seems to really turn on this you know, pathway that leads to break of tolerance and start the march to inflammation. One is gluten, and specifically, this is one of the components the gluten is best studied, it's called alpha-glidin. In a color-coded fragment that they are undigestible of alpha-glidin, these two blue ones, they interact with the intestine and uh, instigate the release of zonum. So gluten, that we know that it's something that some of the kids with autism may be sensitive to, cause an excessive release of zonin, therefore, you know, um, an increased gut permeability. But by far, the strongest and most consistent stimulant to release zonin is dysbiosis, a loss of the symbiotic relationship with our microbiota. And therefore, now there's a lot of evidence that if you have indeed a situation that you lose barrier function, zonin mediated or otherwise, you go from the left side of this, you know, um, slides in which the gut brain axis communicate in a physiological way, maintaining homeostasis and normal function of the brain to a situation loss of barrier function in which, you know, you have development of a series of events, including changes in microbiota composition and microorganisms that have been associated to changing behavior, what we call psychobionts, that eventually will instigate the neuroinflammation as a consequence of inappropriate gut brain access communication. And all this leads me to the next point, and you know, I want to try to wrap it up as soon as I can, um, uh, so that we leave question time for question and answers, to the point that you know, when we start this journey to understand what is the role of microbes in all this, at that time we were under the impression all microbes are bad guys. And therefore we were looking for a quote unquote, the pathogens. So the, the virus that can give us the infection, the bacteria that got infection that can start this. But those are the exceptions. The rules is that the vast majority of the microorganism, the bulk of the microorganism are friendly cohabitants with us. They want to establish a symbiotic, mutually advantageous relationship with us. And if we maintain that friendly relationship, that is the best way that we can eventually stay healthy. Um, also, like many other conditions, there have been tons of papers out there studying the microbiota composition in folks with uh, autism. And, you know, again, if you look at the microbiota kids with autism compared to non-autistic kids, they segregate. They are different. There are differences in distribution of the microbiota. And like on an animal model, even here, this triangulation between gut permeability, different microbiota, the immune function really resign also in the evidence that we've seen in kids with autism. So immune cells from autistic kids produce more pro-inflammatory cytokines. So they are more prone to um, fight when instigated by a pro-inflammatory stimulus. And on the other hand, um, um, you know, the, the kids without them, they, they also have GI symptoms. They produce less anti-inflammatory cytokines. So they are less capable to put a break on inflammation. That is pretty much what I told you about this animal model uh, of, of, of uh, excessive production of zonulin that, you know, have changes in the immune system in which on one hand you have increase of pro-inflammatory cells and on the other hand, do you lose the ones that can put a break on inflammation? And now let's come to what we've been generating so far in terms of, you know, biomarkers. There are two ways that you, you look for biomarkers for any given disease. You formulate an hypothesis, let's say that, you know, 
I believe that uh, oxidative stress um, is or, or mitochondrial problems uh, create a, the, the syndicate to develop autism. And therefore, you specifically look at metabolites and metabolic pathways related to dysfunctions, or you do a, what we call an unbiased analysis. So you take a, a specimen, in this case, you know, uh, let's say the blood or the stools. And just look at all the metabolites there are in kids with autism. You compare to the ones without autism and try to figure out what is the difference. The second is a little bit more labor, labor intense, but much more informative because you don't go with a, a biased approach. You take whatever you see Mother Nature sent to you. And this is the results that we obtained in a paper that was published this year in which <clears throat> we saw a clear difference of um, plasma and fecal metabolites between the kids um, you know, uh, with autism and, and typically developing uh, uh, kids. And, and again, I don't have the time and, and I don't have you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the possibility to go through these details, but it suffice to say that not only we saw the difference, but this difference really correlates quite strongly with the severity of the autistic behavior as established by the ADOS or the SS score. So the more severe is the autism, uh, uh, the more you know, difference there were in terms of this metabolites, in terms of composition and, and abundance. And then we dig into the possibility to try to figure out what they do for a living, what they ask, this metabolites as to the S2. And sure, sure enough, the abnormalities that we see quite consistently, kids with autism, are within uh, the you know machinery for cellular energy, so mitochondria and oxygen stress metabolites. So it looks like that again, what was occasionally and anecdotally reported in the literature as working hypothesis that you know mitochondria can be involved in the pathogenesis, that oxidative stress seems to be involved, has been suffragated and validated by these you know studies. And you know, beside that, we also saw. Um, some changes in steroid hormone levels that seems to be elevated in autistic in, in kids with autism, and, and not only you know steroid hormones, but also other um, metabolic markers that you, you impinge on 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 the uh, lipid metabolism that seems to be different. Again, I, I don't have the time to go into these details, but once again, this validates another other line of research that showed you know something similar before. And then finally, phenolics and biotic metabolites levels are very different. And these are really associated specifically with exquisite specific activities in the metabolic pathways and, and that you know relate to inflammation. So to summarize, you know, th th there are mostly four categories of, of metabolites that we, we were able to see uh, different among kids with autism compared to. Um, normal developing kids. Uh, metabolites related to the, you know, uh, the, the, the pathway of, uh, of lipid formation, uh, markers of mitochondrial function, xenobiotics and phenylpilic metabolites, and, and potential biomarkers for which we've never seen anything before and, and, uh, that we want to validate and, and try to figure out what, uh, what did they do in terms of uh, you know, uh, neuroinflammation. Now, to finish up this chat, and then again, I'll open uh, the discussion, uh, what we want to do. All these are foundational and important information that we need to have really to get the sense why some kids on a specific genetic background take their march in the wrong direction and develop autism. And the entire field, particularly the microbiome field now, has a dear need to move from correlation. So in other words, you know, we take 100 kids with autism, 100 kids without autism, we see the different microbiome that I showed you before, and we make the conclusion these kids develop, you know, autism because of different microbiome. Can be different. Can be the other way around. Can be that because kids with autism, they develop a specific taste and or aversion for food, they eat differently and therefore their microbiome is different. So the, the change in microbiome is the consequence and not the cause of autism. So we really need to move from a correlation to causation if we want to validate by this biomarker and eventually develop a strategy to stratify the population, target intervention, and hopefully primary prevention. The fact that the microbiome 
is a fair target. It's been proved now, not only in animal models, but in humans. This is the, fir the first study that we did in collaboration with many others in which we did fecal transplant in kids with autism. So we took a, a, a series of kids with autism and GI symptoms. We took, uh, you, you know, we, we, we uh, transplant, you know, um, uh, the, the microbiota with, by, through fecal transplant um, of, of healthy individuals. And what we saw in these kids that was a decrease of their GI symptoms, but most importantly, an improvement in their behavior. There was not just temporary associated to the transplant, but was sustainable over time. So even months after the transplant, this change in behavior and the GI symptoms sustainably got better. And this was the consequence that there was an engraftment. So in other words, an acceptance by the host of this new inhabitants, this new microbiota that got in there and started to change this discussion of this gut brain access in more reasonable term, uh, mitigating the neuroinflammation. So why Gemma? Because even this study continued to be a shot in the dark. And we want to really understand cause effect relationship. The only way to do that is to do prospective studies from birth. Because if we can follow the composition, the microbiome, and the other multiomics in a single individual before, during, and after the onset of autism, and we compare to kids that start from the same starting line, so at risk, but they do not, then we will understand what it takes, where are the pieces of the puzzle that eventually will lead to uh, break of tolerance and make us to play our genetic cards in an appropriate way, facilitating the onset of, of uh, autism. This is the working hypothesis so that, you know, the, you know, the, the, this, this, again, uh, the cartoon that I showed you before, and, you know, with this multiomics by looking at the metabolome and metagenomics, uh, the genomics, the proteomics, the lipidomics, in other words, all these omics that tells me what kind of metabolism has been touched by this interplay between the host with his or, or her genetic background and the microbiome and how this translates in a clinical outcome that is nothing else than the expression of specific metabolic pathways that can explain your inflammation. And through that, trying really to understand, to rewrite the natural history of why some kids develop autism. And, you know, we have now some preclinical studies, but the most important, the ones that I really care, are the clinical studies. They are in two phases. One is observation. The only thing that we do, we, we recruit these kids from birth, and we follow them step by step with questionnaires, collection of stools, collection of blood, collection of urine, collection of saliva, to really do all this multiomics. And if any of them will develop the problem, then we go with the second phase, that is the interventional phase, in which based on the data that we've been accumulating with the study, then we can intervene with the manipulation of the microbiome by you know, supplying what we call symbiotic, you know, uh, supplements. So in other words, probiotics, uh, so the good bacteria, together with the, the prebiotics, in other words, you know, substance that can feed the good bacteria, trying to change the ecosystem there and therefore the dynamic that brings the neuroinflammation. Uh, it is a very complex, um, you know, this data needs to be analyzed. And Enrique was telling me before the meeting that he, that's what he does for a living. So he appreciated that we would generate millions and millions of data needs to be fed into this deep machine learning to you know, develop a model and make sure that this model will auto teach itself to be refined to find exactly what it takes to develop autism on a specific genetic background so that we know where to go after what kind of targets. And this is, you know, again, exactly what I was telling you. We need the large scale omic repositories in which we have strong clinical data, strong analysis of, of, of this uh, you know, specimen to have this multi-omic analysis that ultimately will create that crystal ball that will tell us in two months, in three months, in six months, these kids with all these omics, the way it's made, will develop autism. 
and now we know what to do to make sure that we, we know he or she would not derail in that direction and bring them back. I'm going to finish by saying we really need your help. Um, economically, Enrique told you what is the goal of $100,000 uh, to reach, but also, and, and, and even more crucially, help us recruiting. You know, this is, this is a, a situation in which we all need to chip in because this is not a single individual uh, situation. The entire community <clears throat> need to participate uh, in order to really stop these epidemics and, and finally give hope to families, to us all, uh, to stop this, you know, this, this you know, un insanity that I believe that uh, now with the knowledge that we have right now, we have the metrics and the possibility really to finally see the light at the end of the tunnel of something about it. And I want to <clears throat> finish by thanking the crew of, and then and NBRC, there are many more now that join us, and and of course all the entities that is helping us, you know, with uh, with with this the funding uh, to to do this service. Thank you so much, Dr. Fasano. That was that was really a fantastic uh, presentation. So so just to, just to wrap, um, you know, to try to summarize uh, what Gemma is all uh, Gemma is all about. Uh, we have this full set of genes from the child, uh, his or her autistic sibling. Uh, so, so we have uh, the, the the inclusion criteria is for for newborns uh, that have a an a, a, a sibling uh, that has been diagnosed with autism. So, so we have this full set of genes from from the child, his or her uh, autistic sibling, the parents, and then also we have uh, a lot of data that we're going to be collecting over time on the environmental factors, the method of delivery, vag vaginal C-section, antibiotic use whether they were breastfed or formula fed, uh, what they ate, uh, when they started to eat those things, all the medical history, including the illnesses, infections, growth rates, the gut microbiome, before and after they develop ASD symptoms, and, and, and all of those, uh, you know, for those that develop ASD symptoms and for those that didn't. And, and, and this way, we would be able to kind of find these patterns, right, of like, when you are finding these, you know, these reads on the, on the metabolites and, and so on and so forth. And so, so when you combine all this information, we would be, be able to learn, for example, how the production of, say, uh, specific metabolites differ from, uh, from person to person, right? And, and how it is connected to the, to the person's genes and all of these different things. So, so that's a, an amazingly ambitious uh, project. And I just wanted to summarize that because there were some, there were some questions we were receiving about your, your, uh, your perspective on the role of, of, of these different things that I mentioned. I mean, to what extent, you know, antibiotics or, or you know, like mold infections and all these plays a role. And that's exactly what we're trying to, to you know, look after and, and, and understand in more detail, is it not? Yeah, it's, you, you just nailed this uh, nail on the coffin. It's exactly that, you know, again, um, you know, uh, so far we've been taking anecdotal information here and there the pollution on the air, the, 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 the diesel exhaust, uh, the, the antibiotic use, the C-section, um, but that would not give us really an understanding if and how eventually this can impinge in play our genetic cards in an inappropriate way. That's what Gemma is trying to feel in terms of gap of knowledge. It's extremely ambitious, no question about that. But, you know, I am pretty sure that if we do a poll among the people they are listening, if they have any experience with autism in their family, they will find one of these elements that they I mentioned to be part of what probably has been the history of this child that developed autism. But here, we need to go to the next level. We need to go to the level, level of sophistication of modeling. And this takes a huge amount of data and a huge amount of, of time and capability to analyze. But you know, again, Enrique is much more expert than me. You put garbage in, you got garbage out. You need to have solid, validated data, tightly controlled, that will eventually give the, the machines the capability to build a model that is reliable. And to add you know, complexity to complexity, once again, I am convinced that, you know, we talk about spectrum because this is not an homogeneous disease. So ultimately, we're not going to find a single magic bullet that fix it all. 
we're going to find a way to stratify the population so that a subgroup needs to be treated one way, another subgroup treated another way, and so on and so forth. But we need this information to develop these strategies. Absolutely. And, and what, what I think is, is fascinating is, is that it, it's been shown time and time again uh, that it is almost impossible at this point to prove a statistical significance in traditional clinical trial type of settings for autism. Uh, you, you have these placebo controlled and treatment groups, and it's almost always the exact same uh, situation that happens over and over. Uh, like in every clinical trial, you usually have like the few lucky kids that, you know, uh, usually a small set that, that for whatever reason they show significant improvements, whereas the remainder of the, of the treatment groups say it's a little to no improvement, and nobody really knows why that happens, right? Uh, yeah. it, it, because and, and because you have like these you know clinic uh, you know clinical trials that report aggregate level figures, you know we haven't really been able to prove definitively uh, that you know to this day that let's say you know stem cells or microbiota transfer therapy even uh, you know or or blockers of neural active microbial metabolites uh, you know work in general. So so we need to know you know what is it, which which is exactly the reason why. Uh, you know, th these things can improve in certain kids, but not, other, not others. And that's that's exactly what Gemma is is trying to uncover uh, for, you know, uh, you know, to understand, you know, why are children benefiting from certain treatments, but not others? So so I guess my, my, my question is, is, is uh, you know, uh, at this point, you know, if successful and we're, we're all here rooting for you, obviously, uh, <coughs> how will we be able to then, uh, you know, overcome the regular regulatory hurdles right so so we we have like these you know subsets of people and you know with, with something that is such a personalized treatment so first of all let me tell you that you know i would have been shocked if any of this trial including ours will be you know so um uh, you know clear cut in terms of efficacy that we will have a problem resolved already you know, again, this is not an homogeneous population. Let's say make the example that we're dealing with 100 kids with autism, and, and, and there are five different subgroups. A subgroup that has, you know, a metabolic disorders has to do with mitochondria, another one, again, with oxidative stress, another one has a fragile X, another one has gluten sensitivity, another one has, I don't know, uh, uh, another, you know, kind of problem. And let's say that, you know, I want to do a clinical trial to establish the efficacy of the gluten and casein-free diets. So I take all them, all hundreds, and I put all on the, on the gluten-free diets. Only the subgroup that has the sensitivity to gluten, let's say 20% of them, eventually will benefit. But when I do a study double blind like this and I see 20% efficacy, what is my conclusion? That this study failed because the efficacy is relatively low. Now, take the same 100 kids, have biomarkers validated that will let me know among the 100 who are the 20 that they eventually got at the same final destination through the gluten sensitivity path and do the diet intervention only on those 20. Result, 100% efficacy, same group. And you know, with that data, I will be able to convince the legislator, the FDA, whatever, that that intervention is a bona fide good intervention for autism. But again, not a magic bullet that fix them all. If we don't stratify, if we don't have biomarkers to understand which path these kids they got to get the final destination will not resolve the problem. That's what Gemma wants to do. How many paths? And do I know how to put this kid in one pot versus another so that I can't customize the intervention here rather than there? That's the, the ambitions of Gemma. You know, I... I you know, in, in this Gemma study, and also in this book that I wrote recently with Susie Flaherty, uh, that's called Gut Feelings, that is, you know, a state-of-the-art, you know, situation on microbiome, my last page is, it is, it is a, a little story that starts with the title, it is year 2030. And I hypothesize that in year 2030, there is a kid coming in my study, in my you know, clinic, whose name is Gemma, whose brother has autism. And the mother brought Gemma because 
she's having some issues um, that eventually she's a little bit concerned about. So Gemma comes with a chip where the genome, her genome is in there that I put in my computer. They brought the stool sample because I asked them to do so, so that while I visit Gemma, I do this, the stool analysis for the multiomic analysis. I eventually, at the end of my visit, put everything in the computer and an algorithm that Enrique developed, thanks to his expertise, is telling me has stents right now because Gemma had a ear infection and took antibiotics. Now she's in a trajectory two years from now to develop how this molecular brother with a 90% certainty. And the same algorithm would tell me this happened because there is this change in the microbiota, they changed this metabolic pathways that leads to neuroinflammation. It would tell me you got to give this specific intervention, this specific you know, probiotics, this specific food uh, you know, changes and so on and so forth to reshape the microbiome. Do that. Gemma comes back in my office two months later, and the risk, based on rerun the analysis, went from 90% to 3%. 2030. I don't know if I'm optimistic. I don't know if I'm a pessimistic, but I know this is doable. But you, we need studies like Gemma to achieve those goals. Yeah, we, we need we need studies like Genma. We need um, we need data, a lot of data. Um, we need um, a lot of support uh, for sure uh, to to make this uh, happen. Uh, I I sometimes feel like like going outside of the you know the topic a little bit uh, to kind of illustrate what what we're talking about is, is sometimes helpful. But what we're describing here is is like these machine learning algorithms that that are you know being built uh, you know or, or the plan is to build for these type of. Uh, research it, it works very similar to to the way that Amazon predicts your your purchase behaviors. It, it works exactly. very similar to that. I mean, they have a lot of data on your on your on the things that you buy and the things that the things that you do. And so, for example, if you all of a sudden start getting like moving supply uh, recommendations or suggestions, is because they know they can anticipate that you're about to move because of things that you've been buying. So it's the same idea. I mean, we we are kind of uh, preemptively getting all this information of genes, uh, metabolites, uh, microbiome to a specific, very detailed, um, you know, um, uh, type of information. And in that sense, you are able to predict, uh, you know, the, the, you know, like these, these, uh, you know, who is going to develop these kinds of symptoms over time, right? And, and that's kind of the idea behind this. But, but again, I mean, all of that is kind of based on uh, the ability for us to be able to collect information that that you know that we need, which is a lot of information to be able to feed these these models, uh, and and that's why this is so exciting and, and, and so critical at the same time. So so that's that's really fascinating, uh, you know, Dr. Fasano. I am I'm actually being bombarded by questions here, so okay. I have a lot of a lot of questions. Uh, one of them, which I think is is really is really critical, uh, and and sorry, this is a little bit uh, as as a side. Uh, thing for um, you know the, the Gemma study, but you know it, it, we all agree, I guess, in, in this community right here. I mean, we we have heard about like these these studies that you were just referencing. Uh, Alex Saharakis is saying, well, what what you're what you're explaining makes perfect sense to those that subscribe it. What do you say to the rest of the physician community? That doesn't recognize these gut issues. A pediatric gastroenterologist who says that leaky gut dysbiosis and all of the above are nonsense. How do you, how do you overcome that? <laughs> there was a Nobel Prize a while ago that said that science has three stages. One is completely rejection, because you know. Uh, let me step back for a second. Um, you know there are two ways of science. One is you know the, the the incremental science. You are point A and you want to go point B. You know where you are. You can see where you're going. Your peers, they see that. And therefore, you know, eventually, uh, you know, you, 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 uh, can you, can you be, you can be followed on you know, your train of thoughts and what you're trying to do. But sometimes you intend to go to point B and you find yourself in point Z, place where never, nobody's been there before. Most of the time is a dead end. Sometimes, it turns to be a, a transformational new information that shifts completely the paradigm. That doesn't have good friends for a long time. And again, to paraphrase you know, what I was saying, this is a, a process in three stages where you go in point Z. Denial, 
or even scorn. They say you must be on, you know, really, you, you don't know what you're talking about, or you know, you're fantasizing. Then validation. Some people eventually will repeat what you've done and validate what you've done. And then acceptance from the community that will say everybody knew this from the very beginning, even the one that we're criticizing to at the beginning. Now, let's talk specifically about the gut permeability. It went exactly to the same path. You know, at the beginning, tremendous skepticism. A lot of people that they said, this is voodoo science. And then, you know, eventually the score like zonalin, but most importantly, the whole genome sequencing, when you sequence the entire genome, then 23,000 genes of people with problems like diabetes, diabetes, celiac disease, autism, systematically, you have the involvement of genes that control antigen trafficking, genes that control gut permeability. Now, the scientific community will not doubt anymore that gut permeability and the leaky gut is integral part of the pathogenic condition. But this is still premises of the scientific community. To make the journey to the clinical practice, to the one that is, you know, seeing your child, it will take an educational process. If we are not quite there yet. I understand the frustration and I understand, you know, the, the, the social, you know, you know, challenge to remove these roadblocks. But, you know, again, I leave firsthand this experience. In 1996, when we said that the celiac disease was you know, a big deal in the United States, they were accusing us that we're trying to sell refrigerators in the North Pole. Nobody, nobody right now will doubt that celiac disease is a big deal, and nobody will deny a screening to anybody that has even a smidge of symptoms related to celiac disease. But this took time. I believe that this is going to be the same when it comes to this transformation of new information, you got or whatever else that's associated with with autism. Um, so it, it sounds like what you're describing is a chicken and egg type of situation, right? Uh, where you have like multiple biomarkers, uh, you have like these, you know, you have these biases, you have gastrointestinal issues in in most of these kids. You have uh, you have inflammation markers. So um, you know, I, I'm trying to summarize many of the questions that I'm getting uh, by you know like. If there are any any hypotheses regarding how you know how this chicken and egg uh, situation can be, yeah, you know, explained uh, in the case of autism. So, so the only way to do that is to do birth court studies. Why we choose autism? Besides, because the major problem that autism really represents socially, medically, economically, and so on and so forth, because it's a condition that materializes relatively soon in life. Doing a, a longitudinal prospective studies to understand who is the chicken, who is the egg for Parkinson, for example, would be unfeasible because you have to do 70 years of surveillance of an individual to, to answer this question. Not here. Not here. Here, you can really surveil kids for two, three years. That is the time frame in which you expect the kids will start to behave differently if they develop autism. And therefore, we can really understand who is the chicken, who is the egg because you don't do what this technique called cross-section analysis. Take 100 kids with, you know, autism and 100 kids who they do not have it. You look at the microbiome, the different, and you don't know who came first. Now we do. We do because, you know, we know the microbiome before, at the onset, and after. You know, uh, you know autism and Genma is at, at the early stage of this, you know, study. We're in the second year, going, going toward the end of the second year, start the third year. And, and this is happening in the midst of a pandemic that's really locked us down for almost a year and a half. So literally, we're still at the beginning because of the lockdown. But we have another court, birth court, uh, with, with, with kids at risk for serious disease, very similar concept. We already recruited 500 kids. Well, tell you what, through all the data, and we have 150,000 metadata, 15,000 through samples, and so on and so forth. Now we have machine algorithms that can tell me six, nine months before the onset of the disease, who will eventually develop this and who does not, based on the composition of the microbiota and metabolic profile. So we will know who down the road will eventually develop celiac disease. Imagine a goal like this without this, what we can do with that kind of information. So that's what we, we're really aiming to. 
I have no question in my mind that we will reach that goal. My question is when? It's gonna be in a year, five years, 10 years. There are many variables. One of them is not a variable anymore is the technical limitation. I, I'm not an expert, Enrique is, but I don't think that, for example, the power of, of data analysis is a limited step anymore. Uh, I, I really do believe the economic resources, and, and of course, you know, if we got another wave of the pandemic, that will really impinge in a negative way in the process. But otherwise, it's a question of time. We're going to get there. Yeah, and, and I would just, I would just like to say that you know, um, these process that you're describing has been developed for many other conditions, right? So, so this is something that, for example, is done currently all the time in oncology, for example, right? So, so we know all these different mutations that make a person to be predisposed to develop a certain type of cancer. Uh, it's just that up until this point, for whatever reason, we haven't really had like maybe the, the interest, the financial interest, or, you know, I don't know how to call it, to do the same thing for people with autism. Uh, but there's no reason why something like this could not be developed. Um, and, and, and I think that, this, that that's why I personally believe, uh, Dr. Fasano, that this is this is going to be a landmark study for sure. I mean, I, I have no question in my mind that, uh, you know, if successful, we will be able to come up with uh, all kinds of subgroups. We will be able to, uh, you know, be able to anticipate or predict all these different things uh, that make uh, children to be predisposed uh, to having, you know, certain types of, uh, you know, neurodevelopmental uh, issues uh, before they, they happen and hopefully find ways to, to be able to prevent that. But let me tell you why, you know, we reached that goal relatively quickly in cancer. There was a really tremendous push from the community, from association, for no profit organization to really push and, 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 and apply these technologies to really uh, customize specific treatments, achieving goals that were unimaginable a few years ago of, of uh, survival rates. Uh, when when you customize treatment rather than randomly try something, um, you know this is the same push that this, the, 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 the the autistic community needs, and that was you know just not the you know the the, the people with cancer to be on, on the passively on the receiving end. They roll over their sleeves and they will make they made that happening. We need to do the same here, and probably the limited step is the participation in these studies. I understand that having a kids with autism and then involving the second kids with, you know, that is just born is a burden on the family. But this is an investment in the future, your child. Uh, and both of the one that already have the problem and the second one has a problem, a, a, a risk to develop it. So I really, really urge, you know, uh, you guys to go on our website and, and, and try to understand how can I be involved? I can be part of the history. I, you know, you, you Eric, is, keep saying, you know, your studies will be transformational. These are, these are our studies. We have to take ownership of this because the community needs to be part of it. It's not, otherwise, this will take much longer time. Absolutely. No, and I, I, I truly believe that this is, this is really the way to go. I mean, given how complex, uh, you know, the autism disorder has proven to be over the years, um, I, I just, just want to. I, 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 I really want to thank you for your time, Doctor. I mean, this is this has been really fantastic. I, I would be remiss, though, as you, as the the Syrian expert <laughs> that you are, uh, not to ask you one last question about, uh, or you know, probably just uh, ask you to to encourage uh, parents uh, to like follow you know certain things that you personally have found that could benefit uh, children on the spectrum. If, if you don't mind, uh, what what kinds of things would you would you say to parents uh, that could start doing, um, you know, in their kids in case they're, they're not doing some, you know, things, you know, to improve their symptoms, what, what would you, what would you tell them? I think that, you know, and I'm not breaking, you know, uh, unbelievable news that one of the most impactful things that happened in the past few years, is a very, very early behavioral intervention. This kind of intervention, these kids really mitigate or at least slow down the march and then buy more time uh, in in terms of the development of autism. So most definitely, you know, I, I think you know that having the the, the 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 low threshold to be in touch with you know the neuropsychiatrist, the pediatric neuropsychiatrist, as soon as you see some signs, but even preventively, it's important. And then lifestyle. 
I mean, uh, there is nothing else, in my humble opinion, that is more logical in terms of what to do to try to play our cards better in terms of lifestyle, meaning, first and foremost, good nutrition. These macroorganisms, they eat whatever we eat. So a good nutrition will keep the microbiome in good balance. Good sleeping habits. Uh, trying to minimize the stress, trying to minimize pollution uh, exposure. Uh, in other words, I'm not saying going back to cave uh, and work, live as a, 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 a caveman, but I'm saying to try and really to minimize, you know, the, uh, the, the, the factors that we know that have negative impacts on, uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the way that we play our genetic cards until we find a solution through Gemma. Amen. Amen. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll I'll just share the uh, the link to make the donations. Uh, once again, we will actually be also um, sharing the information to enroll uh, to to Genma, and we need to definitely continue to uh, support uh, your efforts, Doctor. I mean, we're we're definitely committed uh, to make this happen, and we'll we'll you you know we'll we'll be we'll be with you guys along the way. So we we really thank you for for everything you do. Like I said, for our children and. Uh, we look forward to having you back, uh, you know, sh to share some, some of the results. So, so thank you so much for your time. I will be, I will be delighted, hopefully, to bring some news in December uh, about Gemma and the, the, the Brain Foundation, uh, um, you know, project that we're collaborating with. So thank you again for having me. And, you know, um, let's work uh, hard together toward this goal. We, we can do it. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Frasano. See you next time. Bye now.